appreciate it. Thank Thanks you, for your kind attention. Thank you, Scott. Um, I will go ahead and, and we'll introduce um, Catherine Holly, who's the lead training and con school consultant and, and the ABA team lead at the UW Autism Center. Um, Catherine, as I understand it, is actually officed at the um, University of Washington Tacoma campus. So Catherine, welcome. And we'll be happy to let you start whenever you're ready. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Just take me a minute. Okay. I'm trying to break the habit of asking everybody if they can see my screen after three years of doing things virtually. I think we've mastered it, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So are we okay to start? Yes. All right. Great. Um, all right. I am not on the first page. There we go. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Catherine Hawley. I am from the University of Washington Autism Center, and I'm really excited to be invited here today to talk about effective communication strategies and classroom management strategies for neurodiverse learners. We'll talk a little bit more about the things we're gonna cover during this time. Um, I also have with me my co-presenter, Patty Matestic. So we're both gonna take a minute to introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, this is me, Catherine, and my cat, Zoe, who may or may not make an appearance today. Um, I am a board certified behavior analyst or BCBA. So trained in applied behavior analysis. I have a variety of experience uh, working in homes with people ages zero through adulthood, as well as working quite a bit in the school setting, um, mostly in the secondary setting and a little bit in the community college setting as a consultant. So working with students and programs to try to set students up for success in terms of meeting their needs and helping the students and the staff to manage um, the unique needs that our different learners have. Um, I will now pass it over to Patty to introduce herself. Hello, um, my name is Patty Matestic and I am a uh, clinical psychologist by training. And I also, I wear a lot of hats at the Autism Center. So I co-direct our ABA launch program, which is an early, um, kind of intensive ABA program. I oversee the parent component. So it's for children that are under the age of six, um, trying to kind of start early with parents understanding neurodiversity and different aspects of how their child may communicate and learn. And then I'm also the director for our Tacoma Clinic location, um, just overseeing daily operations. Uh, clinically, I do a lot of diagnostic work and then have also worked um, outpatient um, therapy cases around typically teens and adults with anxiety management and um, everyday living skills. Uh, and then I'm a member of the training team. So I enjoy coming out to situations or events like this where I can meet with other community members and help support the autism community. So thank you for having us. Thanks. All right, so today we have like an aggressive agenda for our 90 minutes together. We're going to talk, uh, kind of touch on these four main areas, talking about general supportive strategies, how do we set expectations sort of fairly, um, communication strategies, and then at the end, a little bit about managing disruptions. Um, and while I understand the audience say we're talking about neurodiverse learners, a lot of these strategies apply to all of our learners, um, including the pieces around managing disruptions. Uh, so we're going to kind of talk broadly and then talk more specifically. Being from the Autism Center, both Patty and I, that's our area of interest and expertise. So we'll be talking qu quite a bit about autism, but also acknowledging that neurodiversity does not just pertain to people with autism or autistic folks, um, which we will talk about in a minute. And on that note, um, 
we or I and Patty as well, when she's talking, we make every effort to use identity first language. So saying autistic person um, versus person first language, a person with autism. We are continuing to work on making that language shift. It's been um, a long road for us as Mo, or at least Patty and I were trained to use person first language initially. So uh, likely I will go back and forth and I appreciate uh, everyone's sort of patience and understanding as we work to make this language shift. Um, all right, so we will get started. So when we talk about supporting neurodiverse learners in the classroom, there is quite a bit that falls under this umbrella of neurodiversity. So this overwhelming list of things are some of those um, diagnoses or um, identities that fall under this umbrella. And from my experience, I will say that this first group, autism, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, these are things that initially or traditionally are thought of as areas of neurodiversity. And then the umbrella has kind of expanded again. And now we look at things like learning differences like dyslexia or apraxia or hyperlexia. And that is becoming more common um, to be sort of included under this umbrella. And then we are also seeing now expanding into including different types of mental health. And so like bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia. Um, so, all of these things under the umbrella of neurodiversity uh, certainly means that in 90 minutes, we can't cover every area. So as we talk, as I mentioned, my expertise is autism, so I'll talk a lot about that. I think we, I, we take in information from the whole community, so not just from the autistic community, uh, but also to know that this is very much like take what works for you and leave the rest. And what may work for one student was obviously not going to work for all students. And then also including on the autism spectrum that what will work for one student, uh, one autistic student may not work for every autistic student. And as we talk about the language that we use and understanding that neurodiversity is this big umbrella, uh, we also wanna think about one of the first ways that we can support our students is in thinking about how we sort of talk about them and how we conceptualize our students. So traditionally, when we think about the autism spectrum, um, it has been presented as this linear spectrum from essentially like more autistic to less autistic. So if you are quote unquote more autistic, you might be referred to as low functioning, traditionally thought of as maybe somebody who is non-speaking or who communicates using a different uh, method than verbal communication. Somebody who maybe if we think about low functioning wouldn't be expected to be college bound or to live independently. And then we have our other end of this linear spectrum that we've used where we say high functioning. And when we say high functioning, we think like can live independently, should be college bound, um, may be able to easily make friends and get married. This is more what we've thought of as like um, Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, although he has not been identified as autistic, um, or people like Greta Thunberg, who we see in the community doing amazing things. As we've learned about autism and many types of neurodiversity, we know that it is not a linear spectrum and it is not a binary, um, that you can have lots of skills in some areas and less skills in others. So one of the first ways that we can work on sort of supporting our students in this environment is to uh, kind of abandon this idea of this binary of being high or low functioning and look to be more specific essentially. And so this image is often circulated in the autistic community and you will see different descriptions on the sides. These are not the diagnostic criteria for autism. These are areas that have been commonly identified as maybe an area of strength or difficulty in this community. And what we see now is this desire to look at these different areas and say, these are the areas that I need more or less support. So if we look here, if we assume that the 
further you are out in the circle, the more support you need. This person might need more support around the sensory environment. Maybe they have lots of sensory sensitivities and we need to be aware of that when they're in the classroom. And their executive functioning needs more support there, but it's not their largest area of need. Um, and then maybe around movement, they're gonna need to have access to more movement than other students, including other autistic students. So when we look at an image like this and conceptualize autism and other types of neurodiversity in this way, we're acknowledging that everybody has areas of strengths and of challenge or areas where they need additional support. And really that's probably true for all of us, I would imagine. Um, but when we look through this lens, we are not making automatic assumptions based off of a more arbitrary descriptor like high and low functioning. And depending, I think, you know, of course, in the community college setting, it's different than in high school or in public, you know, K-12 education. One of the things that happens in K-12 education, and I think sometimes in higher education, depending on the disability services and how they operate is that we will get information about a student before they arrive. And so that information often um, is gives us an idea of what this person might be like. And so when we see a description like this student is high functioning, we come in with a set of expectations that may or may not be appropriate. And so that is part of also what we're trying to uh, work against here. And when we talk about how we set expectations and how we meet, you know, these unique needs that folks have, uh, we want to try as much as we can to kind of abandon our preconceived notions about what this person must be like because of their diagnosis because of the way that maybe they're described in a static document like a face sheet or an IEP or something like that. All right, so along with this, when we recognize and realize that um, neurodiversity is not a sort of one size fits all and it's not a more or less, uh, what we end up with is a lot of competing needs in the classroom. And so, one of the ways that might show up is that when you have one student that has very clear needs, um, we might see a situation where in order for me to make this accessible to you, it's now inaccessible to me. So there are times when, for example, if um, I'm going to use Patty as my pretend um, student here, that if I'm walking and talking with my student and I am claustrophobic, and so I don't want to go into the elevator, but Patty wants to, um, Patty has chronic fatigue syndrome, and so she's not able to use the stairs. So we could probably just each go our own way and meet at the top. So sometimes that's possible. But if I told Patty, you have to take the elevator, or you have to take the stairs, or you have to take the elevator, these are going to make it inaccessible for one of us. And when we talk about making accommodations and modifications in the classroom, one of the things we want to work towards is not making any one thing completely inaccessible to somebody else. So there are times when an accommodation that somebody needs may impact the entire class in a way that is not um, going to work. So for example, if you are in a science class and we need to use microscopes and we need to do labs, we probably can't have it be pitch black in there for somebody who has light sensitivity. So we wanna, there are going to be these larger examples of people who need really significant accommodations. And that's gonna really be a very individualized plan. And then we're gonna have this other area where folks need accommodations that we can make. And sometimes we will make them and it will be great for everybody. And there will be times when we make these modifications and accommodations to support these students that maybe they don't work as well for one of us, um, but it still is going to work. And so one of my favorite examples, uh, anybody here, and you don't have to identify yourself, who is highly verbal, I put myself in that category. I'm extroverted. I like to talk. I like to socialize. It's 
pretty much always my preferred to call somebody to talk about something or to talk face to face. A lot of the folks that I work with, um, that is not their preferred method of communication. They want email, text message, um, things mailed home. I absolutely can do that. And it is um, not probably that much extra work for me, uh, but it's not my preference. And so, but that's an area where I can say, this is something that it's much less work for me to email you than it would be for you to adjust to the idea of me calling you at any time of the day or night, um, or of me asking you to come in and meet with me when we could do this over email. And so when we think about how we support our students, part of it is the accommodations that we make. And part of it is also this idea of like the cost of the choices that we're making and who is it costing quote unquote more to. And of course that is subjective, uh, but in this example, it's much easier for me to adjust my communication method than it would be for the person that I'm working with to adjust to my communication style. And there are times when that can feel frustrating um, or it can feel like you have to learn to be able to talk on the phone in this world. Um, and then often my clients say, but do I? Like how often do people that are like not, and then they say old, call people on the phone? I don't like to think of myself as old, um, but I guess this may be one way where I still fall in that category. Um, and so this is part of what we will think about as we move into setting expectations. And so when we think about making the classroom accessible, there are certain areas where it's the way we've always done it and it may or may not still be working. So I love a cartoon, I grew up reading the comics. And so we see here in this cartoon, uh, the teacher, our green, maybe like Triceratops, telling the uh, T-Rex, looks like it'll be another F in class participation, Rex. And our T-Rex is holding up his shorter arm, shorter than all the other dinosaurs. And he says, this is so unfair. And so there are ways that we have traditionally participated in education that are really solidly founded in the principles of sort of being neurotypical, non-disabled, um, able to participate as quote unquote, everyone does. And as we learn more about diversity, we see more diversity, we invite more diversity into our educational spaces. We have to think about how do we change our expectations or how do we adjust them to meet everyone's needs or to meet the more people's needs. Everyone's needs may be like a lofty goal, depending on the size of our classes and our schools. So one of the questions we ask ourselves is, how difficult are the things that we're asking? And there are things that we probably traditionally think of as pretty simple, but as we think about different types of brains and different types of folks, we learn that they may be more difficult than we originally thought. So uh, my made up scale here of when we think about how difficult something is, we maybe go from one end, which is like, this is no problem, to this other end where we're thinking about something that is overwhelming to the point of shutdown. Um, and then in the middle is that kind of sweet spot where it's difficult but manageable. So if we think about something like reading the syllabus, um, the majority in my pretend scenario of students say, this is pretty much no problem. Like maybe I don't love this activity, but I am able to access the syllabus. I can read it. I can take in this information. And then some of us, maybe we're gonna find a little bit difficult, but it's manageable. And maybe it's difficult because of the reading. Maybe it's difficult because of the amount of information. Um, I was recently enrolled in a graduate level class and I really think the syllabus was 32 pages, which was a lot of information to take in. And then there's gonna be some of us where this document is so overwhelming, I can't look at it, I can't read it. I might not even be able to stay in this class because looking at an entire semester or quarter's worth of information at once is not 
that does not work for me. Or I find it overwhelming and I maybe don't have the skills yet to manage that anxiety or that overwhelm. And then we have everybody's other favorite uh, school activity, the group project. Um, and uh, some people love them. I, even as an extrovert, don't love a group project. Um, I like to be able to do things on my own time, which is usually at the last minute. And I like to work in sometimes the middle of the night or the early morning when other people don't wanna be working. And so this is a more maybe common example where we see this difference in difficulties. So there's like the couple of people or the one person who's like, love a group project. This is my dream come true. Again, in my made up class, the majority of people feel like this isn't my favorite, um, but I can handle it. And then we're going to have folks that this is really not going to work for them. And this may be somebody who is uh, very introverted. It may be somebody who um, doesn't have or doesn't feel confident in their social skills or doesn't relate to others in the quote unquote typical way. It could be somebody like me with ADHD who has a really difficult time with time management and has difficulty adhering to other people's timelines um, because I work in my own way. Um, and then also the anxiety of knowing that and knowing that other people may get frustrated with me or other people may be relying on me for something that then doesn't get to them when it was planned to. And so there's a lot that goes into these different types of activities that are more like traditional learning. And then there's also this other piece that I hear in the back of my head and have heard from um, educators around, like, you kind of have to be able to do group projects. Like, in the world, very few of us truly work in a silo. Um, and that is true. But there's also again, these like push and pull of what is, what are we doing here? Are we preparing you to go into the working world? Are we trying to teach you this academic skill? Are we trying to work on your socialization and your ability to relate to other people? Uh, there's often multiple things we can learn from doing one activity. But for folks who find something like a group project so overwhelming that they may not be able to complete it or even start it, we might ask ourselves, is the point of this project the sort of social piece of learning to work together? Or is the point of this project to learn this academic material? And if the point of this project is to learn the academic material, then maybe for our folks who truly find this aversive, um, maybe they are able to work by themselves because the point is not the working together piece. Um, but then, in the times where our goal really is to work together, maybe we can be more flexible in how we work together or in what we're working on. Um, and so as we think about setting expectations, we want to keep these differences in mind and we want to think about how we can work off of somebody's strengths to help them to be successful within sort of the confines of our class topic, the subject matter, the things that we need to accomplish. So part of um, looking at a strengths-based model is occasionally understanding where we also don't have strengths. So we having awareness of that, but then when we know what is difficult, we also then can look at what are we good at and how can we build on that? So I'll speak from my experience in applied behavior analysis and working in the school system, oftentimes, or previously, and I was certainly trained this way in behavior analysis, we would look at what is the least developed skill? What is the area where you have the most difficulty? And we would be, you know, we would be instructed to and work with families and say, this is the area where this person has the most difficulty. This is where we need to start because this is where they have the most room to grow. Um, now I look back on that and I'm horrified um, because nobody wants to do the thing that they're the worst at all the time. Um, and so what we now want to look at is what what are you good at? What do you like? What are you successful with? And let's 
build off of that. And then maybe we will also bring in some of these areas where we want to learn more skills. Um, but we don't want to spend all day asking you to do things that you're really not good at or that you really don't enjoy. That's certainly not going to be motivating. And so when we think about making a you know, differences in expectations, either for one student or all of our students, working with them to kind of recognize their strengths and how they think they can be successful, and then figuring out if that meets with our essentially bottom lines. So again, these strategies can be applied in kind of a one-on-one -on -one setting with a student, also with a whole class where we sort of share the discussion of, for me, if I'm the teacher, what is my bottom line? And knowing that what has to get accomplished in this quarter or semester for me to feel like we can, I can you know, either pass you or move you on to the next phase of your education. Um, and that's gonna be very different depending on our environments. And then we can also work on understanding the bottom lines of our students as well as their strengths to share this discussion in a sort of in a collaborative way to hopefully the dream is to meet everybody's needs. And so as the professor or the teacher, you get your bottom lines met. And as the student, I get to work in a way that is, uh, you know, works with my neurotype, works with my skill set, and I leave feeling like I've learned the material I needed to learn. Again often easier said than done, especially depending on um, how much flexibility you have in the curriculum that you're teaching or the type of class you're teaching. Um, like if anybody here, like, uh, you know, working with like nursing students, doctors, like, or pre-med, maybe there's not as much opportunity to change the bottom lines. There are certainly there more specific skills folks have to have. But maybe there are other areas where we can be more flexible, like excusing you from the group project, or maybe you don't turn in homework daily, you turn in a cumulative assignment, um, maybe something that can meet both of our needs. And then the other big piece of this idea of kind of understanding what is something that somebody can't do versus something that they won't do. And there is no hard and fast formula here. Uh, more traditionally with folks who are neurodiverse, there could be misconceptions that they're refusing to do something or looking for a way out of assignments, of activities that really fall under this category of something that I quote unquote can't do. And in this case, I would consider a can't do something that is I'm either physically unable, so I have a skill or a motor skill deficit or difference. It could be something where I don't have the prerequisite skills to be able to complete this. But then there's also this other category that is less clear where the cost for me to do this so far outweighs the benefit that it becomes essentially impossible. And so, um, whether this is like how much it's going to cost me emotionally or cognitively, or it's going to be exhausting to me in some way, even though I really want the thing at the end, which is maybe to complete the class or to get the degree, the cost of this activity or this thing is so much that it outweighs that benefit. And so theoretically, I can do it, but really realistically, I'm not able to. And I think that's the, for me, I'll say that's the hardest area to balance is to understand that cost. Um, and then there's this other area of the won't do's. And this is the like, I don't like this. I don't prefer it. I don't really wanna do this. Sometimes that's okay. There's also sometimes where we wanna um, think about like, I understand that you don't prefer this, but maybe this is an opportunity to work, um, work on learning some distress tolerance in an appropriate way with the right supports. Uh, but when we see something that falls under this category of can't do, we want to be, this is the time where we really need to change the expectations for the person to be successful. In the won't do category, it's a little bit uh, more gray, I would say. 
Um, and yeah, I appreciate your comment, Crystal, in the chat um, about the can't do versus won't do in the area of OCD. Um, and I agree that it's very difficult um, for people to understand. I also think for like different levels of, or different I don't want to say levels, but people with different types of neurodiverse brains, um, it can be hard for them to understand too. Uh, there are certainly things that I, um, even though I identify as neurodiverse, have difficulty understanding about other neurodiverse people. All right, and then our last, uh, when we think about setting expectation area that we want to talk about is this idea of compassionate humility. This is not my phrase. This came from a student at the Stanford Neurodiversity Project. I think that is the name of uh, their project. And they are working, um, so this came from a video of, they were talking about dorm living in college. And what this student was talking about was this idea of putting these two things together to understand um, and sort of give what I would call the benefit of the doubt, to understand that we don't understand everybody's circumstance, the level of difficulty that they experience with different things, the level of maybe like suffering or sadness or um, depression that they may experience around their individual differences. And being able for us as like typically the people in power, right? The professor, the teacher, the providers to be humble and understand that despite everything we may know, we don't know everything and we don't know an individual experience. And so I said at the beginning that Patty and I both uh, have a lot of interest and expertise in the area of autism, but neither of us are autistic. And so we can't ever have that lived experience. So as much as we may know, we also have to know that we don't know. Um, and then I think of the example I think of when I heard this was I worked with a client in the home setting and we were working on emptying the dishwasher. It was a little bit of a different type of programming. And it would take sometimes like two to three hours. Um, and this was like mind blowing to me um, because in a lot of ways, this would be a person who would have been considered pretty quote unquote high functioning, lots of skills. Um, and I remember working with this child or this young adult's parent, and we both were kind of scratching our head of like, is it a can't do? Is it a won't do? How can we make this happen faster? Um, and essentially, like, do we really believe that it really takes this long to empty the dishwasher? Um, and I think this was one of like, for me, the most salient times of like, practicing this compassionate humility because it came very clear to me like I don't need to academically understand everything that is happening here to accept that this is a very difficult and complex process for you and perhaps this isn't a realistic or desirable thing for us to be working on and so I think for me part of what was happening was I wanted to be able to explain it and say, this is a manifestation of this, of this processing delay or this symptom of autism or this symptom of ADHD. And while it could have fit into those categories, it was quite extreme. Um, and so sometimes we just have to know that we don't know and we have to believe what people are telling us and then utilize that information to maybe make different, change our expectations, make accommodations, make modifications, even if we don't fully understand what is happening. Alrighty, we are going to now move on to talking about communication. To start this section, we are gonna do a quick activity. So we are gonna go into breakout rooms and for folks, here that uh, do not want to um, be in a breakout group, you don't um, like to talk to strangers, this is not your jam, or this is not your preference, please, this is optional activity, so don't feel as though you must participate. Um, it is, we find, a uh, meaningful activity that can give us some perspective, especially if we do not have a communication difference. So what we will do in our small groups of two to three folks will be to go into your group and 
talk or tell others about your weekend without using any words with the letter R. And so if you communicate verbally, this means you wouldn't say any words with the letter R. If you communicate via um, a communication device, that would mean we would take out all the words with the letter R. And if you're communicating via sign, then to take out again, all of the words with the letter R. So if you use an A, uh, a communication device or if you communicate via sign language you already have a communication difference and so this activity um, may be less salient for you but for folks who don't experience a communication difference um, this can often give us a small glimpse into what that experience might be like. Okay, I think we are all here. Yes, perfect. All right, so if anybody is comfortable or whoever is comfortable would like to share about their experience, either as the listener or as the talker um, or the communicator without using the letter R, we would love to hear from you. You can either unmute yourself um, or you can utilize the chat. what you noticed or what was difficult or what was if there was something that was easier you need to have a comment in the chat oh oh you were yes <laughs> thank you for um okay so uh, chris says that her or their vocabulary is not large enough yeah so we were having to use different words to describe. Uh, maybe we were less specific. So just trying to get to the point. Um, I saw that in my group. So uh, we were maybe one sentence to describe our weekends. Um, and then having to really focus and think about the words. Um, maybe that was different than typically when you're talking or communicating, taking more time to figure it out. Um, yes. And let's see here, having to split your attention. Um, so this, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, a little bit like trying to communicate in a foreign language um, where you don't know or you're searching for the words. Um, and then Scott's noticing um, that maybe they were looking up and off to the left or right to try to find the words. Yeah, and fewer nonverbal behaviors because um, you're thinking more and more about what you're going to say. So these are all great observations um, and very in line with typically um, the types of experiences that folks have. We had in our group and likely in some other groups, uh, the R police. So somebody who is listening to hear if others use R. I am also often that person. Um, and so when we think about being the listener in this situation, some of the things that we notice are, yes, absolutely, our split attention. So I'm both trying to hear what you say, but I'm also really thinking about what I'm going to say, because it's taking me more time to get that ready because I have to think so much about it. And so when we think about students or people that have um, either a communication difference or a processing difference, so maybe it takes them more time to take in information and figure out what to do with it, um, this may um, be similar to the experience that we're having in this very small, short um, activity. Um, we also see um, like sometimes in some groups we've seen people use what we call compensatory strategies so they want to write it down before they say it those are typically our like very uh detail oriented sort of type a folks who want to make sure they do it right the first time um and then we have others who uh, may kind of fly by the seat of their pants do their best and go oh I missed, I made a mistake, I did an R and that's okay. Uh, so we learn a lot about different ways of communicating and how difficult it can be. 
the other thing, and I noticed this in our group, um, but I've seen it in other groups as well, is that there's much less reciprocity, the going back and forth that we maybe see more typically. So um, like somebody in my group just now was talking about, um, they didn't say reading, but I'm going to say reading, reading a book. And normally I would say, what are you reading? Do you like it? Should I read that? What kind of books do you like? Um, in this case, no follow-up questions. <laughs> too difficult without using the letter R. And so we see like essentially everybody just took their turn and then we kind of awkwardly sat in silence for a few minutes. So we see these differences that can sometimes mimic the communication differences we see in others. And while if you don't have a communication difference, we can never really have that experience um, because for those of us without a communication difference, we knew it was only five minutes until we could start using the letter R again. So there was that end in sight. Uh, but we do this activity as a way to sort of experientially remind ourselves that communication is not always as straightforward as it seems um, and that there can be quite a bit that goes into it. And this is true for folks with um, autistic folks. That is a big part of being autistic is communication differences, um, but also for people who English is not their first language, who have communication differences like apraxia, where it's physically harder to get the words out. Um, and if we were did this activity perhaps in the chat where the expectations for reciprocity are different, we expect more time in between what somebody says and when they respond, we might have seen more back and forth. And we should remember that, Patty, because maybe we should do that next time to see the difference. And so also thinking about like, a couple people mentioned like they were looking away, they were looking down. Um, so the difference is in our body language. And that is one of the things that we often see with autistic folks is that they don't use as much body language. They don't talk as much with their hands. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but one may be that they're so focused on what they're going to say that that is where the energy is going. Um, and then I appreciate this comment that Nancy made about follow-up questions, that if we ask a lot of follow-up questions, it could also be putting the burden back on that person who has the communication difference. So if I know that Patty has a lot of difficulty communicating verbally, and I want to catch up with Patty, I might make a different kind of coffee date where we both have coffee at home and we use instant messenger to catch up so that I can feel like I can ask her lots of questions and she can have a chance to, you know, sort of tell me about things without that additional burden of having this high level, long-term verbal communication. Okay, so when we think going forward about how we can implement some strategies to improve communication in the classroom, uh, just to belabor the point a little bit, we want to always remember that there are the behaviors that we observe, the things that are above the waterline in our iceberg here, which could look like a variety of things. Um, in this case, I'm giving an example based around autism because that is what I know the most about. So we might see students that don't answer when we call on them. They might monologue, quote unquote, during class where they tell a very long, maybe relevant story, maybe only closely related, um, maybe coming to you and asking for accommodations or modifications in a way that feels like demanding. Um, or maybe they wait until the very last minute to ask for an extension. So we see these observable behaviors. Um, but then there's all these things that we like under the waterline here of our icebergs, all the underlying reasons that this may be happening. And so we might see some difficulty with expressing wants and needs. Again, that difficulty with verbal communication, um, some difficulty with adhering to social norms or more traditional social norms. And so depending on what we know about our student and how familiar we are with them, oftentimes the things that we see 
um, are not always like so clearly related to what is happening under the surface, or we're not aware of all of the things that are happening under the surface. And so one of my like aha moments was working with somebody who did have quite a long processing delay. And I was just convinced that they did not want to participate. Um, and really what was under the surface there was I wasn't waiting long enough. I wasn't giving him enough time to participate. I had to be patient, which is certainly not my strong suit. Um, and I had to learn to sit in that what was uncomfortable for me amount of time in between asking a question and getting a response. So some strategies we can use in our classrooms or in our environments to help support communication differences. We can really look at this multiple means of communication. How can people get a hold of you? How can you get a hold of them? How can they communicate with their peers? being really clear and concise with our expectations. And so oftentimes knowing the why behind things is important, but we also know like, especially for autistic folks that when we can be as direct as possible, um, that is helpful in being able to meet those expectations. There are lots of sort of, we call them sometimes hidden rules or hidden expectations in an educational setting. Uh, often the most obvious one is like when we come into a physical classroom, the students sit at like the tables and desks and the teacher or professor is at the front of the class. Uh, maybe like in kindergarten that gets specifically addressed, but typically on the first day of a college class, we don't say, I'm going to sit here and you guys sit there. It's implied. Um, and people may or may not know that. So we also, when we think about being clear and concise with our expectations, it also means considering things that typically go unsaid. Um, and so I have a friend who uh, teaches at U UW Tacoma and UW Tacoma, some departments, you call professors by their first name, some you call them doctor, some you do whatever they tell you to do. In her department specifically, they all go by doctor, last name. Um, and so because the expectations on this campus are not consistent across departments, she makes a point to say that on the first day of class. I want you to call me Dr. Holly, um, but it's not me. <laughs> um, and that way, as opposed to having to like reactively correct the person or be upset or feel disrespected, that is something that is important to her and to this department. And so they say it up front. And um, another way that sometimes gets addressed is people hear what other people are calling the professor. So they hear other students. And so maybe they have a student that they've had many times and that student does use the professor's first name, but that's more of an indication of the level of sort of working or professional relationship they have or friendship. And it wouldn't be expected that on your very first day of school, you call this person by their first name. So that's one example of a sort of hidden or implied or inferred rule, but there are lots of them and lots of them are social and people with different types of neurodiversity or neurodivergence may have more or less skills around um, so meeting social expectations or observing what is happening in the environment and then acting on it. Um, in addition, uh, everybody's favorites, probably pretty common now, but utilizing rubrics. And I think we typically see rubrics utilized in a specific assignment, but also thinking about if there is an expectation for participation, what does that actually mean? What does a rubric for that look like? Does it mean showing up every day? Does it mean raising your hand and volunteering at least once per class? So for somebody who is very, very um, adverse to sharing in a group setting, raising their hand and answering a question once in a quarter could feel like a huge level of participation. Um, I think traditionally we would think of that as, or I, I would say I would not think of that as a lot of participation, uh, but for that person it is. 
And so whether it's sort of individually with your student thinking with a specific student, thinking about what their participation will look like, or setting that expectation at the beginning of the quarter or the semester so everybody knows and knows what to expect and is able to address that if they think they can't meet these expectations or this is gonna be a problem um, in some way or a difficulty. And then also thinking about chunking information. And so we often think about chunking in terms of teaching academically related material together. Um, we also can think about this with like expectations and how we are delivering information to different types of learners, where as opposed to sort of jumping around that we're really focusing on giving like information at the same time. So like when we're talking about assignments for the year to talk about them all together um, and then also continue to address them as we go. Uh, but there also will be times when for you as the person who's designed the class or who has been in, is very familiar, you will see the relationships between different types of materials that other people may not see, especially if that is an area that is more difficult or impacted for that person. So folks with ADHD, they often have have difficulty relating their own thoughts and ideas, and then also seeing the relationship between other people's thoughts and ideas. Uh, this also can mean on the other end that for your students that have more difficulty relating information, um, what they turn in may be kind of like a a hot mess, as the kids say, where it's not as easy to see how all of these thoughts are related um, in a coherent, like in a page or in a essay. So for somebody who has difficulty relating their thoughts and ideas, they may benefit from, as opposed to writing a paper, turning in a concept map where we have a more visual representation of how these thoughts and ideas are related. Some other what other strategies we can use? Uh, having frequent breaks. So this type of learning that we're doing right now with lots and lots of verbal output and for you guys so graciously, lots of listening for people who are auditory learners, this works for them. Um, as we know, there are lots of different kinds of learners. So there are likely people here who are like, I wish this lady would stop talking. And that is okay. Um, and so when we have a lot of any one type of input, whether it's verbal, whether it's lots of reading, lots of watching, having frequent breaks can really help. And everybody has a different idea of what frequent breaks might look like. So for me, frequent breaks is like, if I'm giving a presentation, about 10 minutes every hour. Um, because I know people need to get up, they need to walk around, they need to like check their phones, all those things. Um, and then, but for somebody else, that might look like every five minutes. Like I need a one minute break every five minutes. So probably in teaching a class, like if we took a one minute break for every five minutes of this presentation, we would be here a for a long time. And then also it would be pretty disjointed. So sometimes the frequent breaks are something that we build in to our class. And then sometimes it's a more individual accommodation that we make where it's like, if you need to get up and walk around every 10 minutes, I'm going to know that and I'm not going to penalize you for it. Um, because you are maybe you are missing more class than others, but that is okay because that's what you need. Um, and then the last two thinking about making those connections explicit. So really being clear about how these things are related or maybe why or highlighting what is more important. So some ways that we indicate something is important when we're giving lectures is repeating the same point many times. Sometimes we emphasize and we start to, we say something louder or we talk more slowly or we give a cue like, this is really important. And if I'm a student, when a professor says, this is really important, I think this is probably gonna be on the test or something. Um, that might not be as obvious to folks who have different learning styles or who don't pick up on the same 
social cues or connections. So we might have to say, you might notice I've repeated this quite a bit. I'm repeating this because it is a really important point. Um, and so making those things known um, or saying, like when we talk about setting expectations, when I underline something on the board or something is in bold on the PowerPoint, that means you need to pay attention to this because it's going to be on a test or a part of an assignment. So making that clear. And then the last one, my most favorite, uh, visual supports. So writing it down, showing a picture, giving a product sample. If you are assigning, um, like a paper, let's say, um, that you're showing an example of this is an A paper, this is a B paper, this is a C paper. Or if it's a group project, providing um, a sort of end result and using that as a way to help people to understand what is expected. Because as helpful as a rubric may be, that may not be the most accessible way for that person to understand what's expected. For example, like me, somebody with ADHD, I look at the rubric and I'm like, yes, the first day of the assignment, I'm like, I'm going to check off every single one of these things. I'm going to get like uh, an A plus, 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 plus. Um, and then when the time actually comes, I'm like, I can't even look at this rubric because it's so overwhelming. But if I have an example that I've seen of what is it is supposed to have looked like, I can call on that in a less sort of overwhelming and threatening way and say, okay, this is kind of what I need to do. Um, and so these are some additional ways that we can kind of help to communicate sometimes verbally, but also our expectations. Um, and I see in the chat comments about syllabuses or syllabi, syllabuses, I don't know which it is. Um, it's syllabi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that there are, yes, institutions require so much specific information in the syllabus. Um, and that it makes it difficult because you can't just like take that information out. And I'm guessing, depending on your institution, maybe you're not supposed to say things like, don't worry about this part, only read this part. <laughs> I'm guessing that probably um, is not always allowed. Um, but I, so I do agree that they can often be very, very overwhelming. But if there are ways visually that we might be able to make certain point, points more salient, like if it's like a PDF, like using different colors, or I've seen some professors who put boxes around certain paragraphs as a way to like make that information more like stand out to you um or uh, yeah I think unfortunately this is one of right the pieces about education and working within a larger system is that we might want to um the things that we want to change to make it more accessible the institution has not always caught up to that yet um and also like depending on how many classes somebody's taking you know when you get four 30 page syllabi um that becomes additionally overwhelming, especially when there's a lot of the same information in every single one. Um, yeah, Catherine, do you mind if I just make yeah, a really, really quick plug? Um, our One of our sessions today has uh, disability services providers from higher ed coming. So I think we should also bring this up during that group too, because that, that we could talk about that over there as well. It might be good. Absolutely. Yeah, and one of the, I would be curious what, the, uh, those folks think about this. One of my sort of comically favorite parts of reading a syllabus is how buried the disability services information often is. It's like towards the end. And again, like often because that's where it needs to be. But I'm like, well, I'm never going to make it to this part of the syllabus to, un to get this information. <laughs> so, uh, right. Um, looks like we've got some other ideas in here around like putting information in several places, posting announcements. Yes, thank you. Um, often when we get our big list of assignments at the beginning of the quarter, we feel like we can do it all and then kind of lose track as we go. So as we think about these strategies, some that we're going to talk about in a minute, it also can be overwhelming to think about like, I could change this, I could change that, I could redo my whole class before I offer it again. Um, and so 
you know, as uh, universal design for learning reminds us and tells us, we want to try to be realistic as we go and think about, you know, continuing to use this plus one approach. So sometimes there are specific ways that we can like take a lecture and we can break it into smaller parts. We can also think about if we're going to offer more modes of communication, if that's a personal goal or institutional goal, that could look like just adding one additional layer. It doesn't mean now I have to have email, phone, Slack, texting, Canvas messaging, you know, um, Zoom messaging. So we can think about like not making it so that it is successful and that it's realistic for us as well. Because I think the idea, right, is that we want to have these like quality changes versus quantity changes. And I certainly am an, ex an excitable person. So when I learn lots of new information, like I'm going to do it all and I'm going to do it tomorrow. Uh, but often that is not as successful as picking one piece and then and then also building on our own strengths. So we want to do that with our students. We also want to do that with ourselves. So if there's an area that you feel like this is an area where I can, I'm really strong and I can make these quality changes, that might be a place to start also so that you feel successful because experiencing success for all of us is a big piece of keeping this process going. Alrighty, we are going to go now into our last area that we plan to talk about which is a little bit about managing disruptions. And so there are disruptions that come in all sizes, shapes, and forms in a group setting of any kind. We are gonna talk about some whole group strategies and then some individual strategies. So in this context where we are talking about neurodiverse learners, um, there are disruptions that occur that may be a manifestation of somebody's difference or disability. And so we go back to our communication of the iceberg that we use with communication and we think about what might we see. Um, continuing to talk until a thought is complete. So likely in a group setting, we've all had the experience of, uh, you know, you ask a question and then somebody starts to talk and then you want them to stop because it's been enough time or we are, they're getting off topic. And so we're trying to get that to wrap up, like playing them off at the Oscars, but they keep talking and maybe even talk over you to complete their thought. Um, we might also see things like people being frequently in and out of their seats, which may or may not be disruptive, depending on a variety of things. Uh, we might see and hear repetitive behavior, something like loud tapping, humming, vocalizations, um, or flapping, clapping, all kinds of different repetitive behaviors. We also may see things that are a little bit unexpected or maybe becoming more common now. Things like folks wanting to wear sunglasses inside or wanting to wear a hat to block out the light or somebody bringing in different sort of sensory items that will make them feel more comfortable in a different environment. And so when we see these things, um, we can ask ourselves like, what does this indicate? What does this mean? Is this a disruption that needs to be addressed? Or is this something that a person needs in order to access this environment? And so again, when we think about what is under the surface here, we think about, um, in this case, maybe some symptoms or manifestations of autism. So when we think about something like an intense interest, if we are talking about my area of special interest, and I have a thought that I want to complete, I may be essentially unable to stop myself from finishing this thought. Um, and this is not just for autistic folks. This can happen like for anxious folks, um, people with other um, needs. But it's like there, it, for me, the consequence of not finishing this thought is so distressing that I'm going to do whatever I can to finish it. Um, and maybe, and sometimes the more you try to stop me from finishing it, the more distressed I become, so the more dysregulated I become. And so um, that often can end up in, if I had just let you finish this thought, we would probably have moved past this by now, but because I've tried to interrupt or stop, it's become a much larger issue. Um, not to say that we have to let everybody say whatever they want for as long as they want, but it's something to be cognizant of. 
uh, we also see a lot of sensory sensitivities and differences. So this is commonly associated with autism, but I think a lot of us have different sensory sensitivities or differences. Um, and so what I'm going to ask you guys to do now, and we can do it in the chat, is to think about the environment either that you're in right now, or maybe the environment that you teach in. What kind of sensory input do you notice in those environments? So thinking about the sight, sound, maybe the taste, depending on what environment you're in, um, touch, smell, I, mean, I always forget one. Um, so you can either use the environment that you teach in or the environment that you're in now, if you're still in remote learning or remote teaching. Um, yes, fluorescent lighting, that is like always number one. <laughs> um, oh, we got, it. yep. I will say I, uh, oh, the ticking clock. Um, Patty will know this in our clinic. We have a couple of clocks that I swear they get louder, the quieter it is. Um, gum chewers. Oh, my mom, my mom, she yeah, bans gum in her presence. Um, foot or pen tappers, a video playing, whoops, too loud or too soft, cars going by. Um, yep, ice cold air. Oh, I hate being cold. Um, loud instrument noises like an ice machine, a freezer. Absolutely. Um, humming electronics. Yep. Sometimes too cold, sometimes too hot, depending on the season and the sun. Yes the HVAC, lab hoods. I'm assuming that those are like above the, not like an actual hoodie wear. <laughs> um, side conversations while someone else is talking. Um, environmental noises, dogs barking, yes. So yeah, tons of different types of sensory input. And some of us are gonna be more successful in blocking those things out than others. So I typically like, don't really notice like the hum of electronics. Like I'm in my office, there's an ice maker on the other side. I hear it when it drops ice, but it doesn't distract me. Um, but if somebody is talking around me, like if my husband gets up and he's on the phone or I'm in the office and other people are talking, forget it. I need to know what they're talking about. I need to listen. I probably want to participate. Um, even when it's not appropriate. Um, and so that's something that for me, I really can't block out. Um, and then there are other people with different sensory sensitivities. Like if you have very, very sensitive smell, there may be a smell in an environment that nobody else can smell, but you can smell. And it is so overwhelming that it makes it difficult for me to think about anything else. Um, or like for folks with ADHD, especially the hyperactive presentation, uh, when we ask them to sit still at their desk, and I think this is more common in younger uh, education, but I think it does still happen, where we say, this is your seat and you need to sit here and listen and be quiet. That is essentially the same as if I asked all of you to do jumping jacks throughout this entire presentation, you, right? You likely wouldn't be able to listen as effectively. You might be tired. You might not want to stay, probably. <laughs> um, and so these are also sensory needs, like the need to move. Or if I, like with the fluorescent lights, that's why we see a lot of people wearing glasses. So when we think about disruptions in the classroom for everyone, um, but especially for people that have known sensory sensitivities, one of the first things we want to think about is, is this a sensory experience? Let me take inventory of this environment and see, is there something that's different? Maybe there's construction today and that's different. Or maybe like somebody burned popcorn in the faculty lounge upstairs and the whole building smells like burned popcorn. Um, or, um, you know, we've got new lights, all of those things. Um, and so thinking about different sensory experiences, especially if somebody has like a behavior that you feel like, quote unquote, comes out of nowhere. Oftentimes, the first thing we look at is the sensory input. We don't always know what it is. The person doesn't always know what it is, but those types of changes can be really um, jarring and really difficult. And then we also want to think about like what behavior the person is engaging in. And if this stems from some area of difference or disability, 
we want to know that. So we kind of know how to help address it versus again, like assuming that somebody is just being disruptive because they would like to be disruptive or for the person who engages in the foot tapping, that is a sensory need. Um, we might want to look, figure out how can we work with you so that you can get your sensory need met, but also that I can teach this class because if the foot tapping is my sensory sensitivity that really bothers me as the teacher, we're going to have to compromise here because I have to teach the class and you have to listen to the class. So what can we do to meet in the middle here? So when we think about whole group strategies, because a lot of these strategies apply to everybody for managing disruptions, we want to think about establishing class norms. And I think the older, like when we're in community college, college, post-secondary, we might have more luck in talking with our students as a whole about what they need in their learning environment. And so if there are things like, you know, you're receiving a student who engages is in a lot of movement, a lot of pacing, for example, you might say and establish that as a class norm that anybody who needs to pace should pace in the back of the room and that's okay with me. Or if that's going to be really distracting, or maybe if you're in a lab environment that's unsafe, we might say anybody who needs to move during class can stand in this part of the hallway. And if I see you out there, I'll make sure to talk loud so that you can hear me. So you can both access this environment and get what you need. Um, we also wanna think about being direct again with what we can and cannot tolerate. And then also in the moment when, if there is a disruption, giving that direct but kind feedback. So, if you are trying to interrupt somebody who is maybe engaging in some significant monologuing, saying, Patty, we need to move on. I need you to stop talking. Um, it can feel like even just doing it in pretend felt a little uncomfortable to me. <laughs> um, so to be very direct can be hard. But if I say something like, okay, Patty, like, you know, we're, we're getting ready to move on. That might not be clear enough. The person might not understand what you're asking of them. And then that confusion is additionally dysregulating. And then also if there's something um, that you need somebody to do, if we need everybody to be quiet and re-engage to say that as opposed to something like, I'll get started when everyone's ready, um, because that might, I might not be ready <laughs> or I might not know how to show you I'm ready. Think, and then now this is sort of like something you would set up with your students ahead of time, but if you expect that there will be disruptions or if this is something that is just part of what you do with your students, being upfront with what you will do in the moment of a disruption. So um, in the class that I was last in, it was a social work program. So there were going to be some pretty intense conversations that were around like race and economic disparities, different areas where people might have had different opinions or thoughts or things they wanted to communicate. And so the professor told us basically her list of non-negotiables of things that she did not tolerate in the class. And so she said, if I hear blah, you know, X, Y, and Z, I will interrupt you and ask you to stop talking. If you do not stop talking, I will remove you from, because this was on Zoom, I will remove you from the Zoom room and we'll meet later. And so there was no surprise over what would happen. And in this case, it did not happen for the whole quarter, but everybody knew what to expect and what the professor would be doing in those moments of anticipated disruption. Um, and then you also want to tell your students, what do you expect them to do in the moment of a disruption? So if you have a student in your class who maybe has experienced or has engaged in disruptive behaviors in the past, or who is part of sort of a cohort model where other students know them, if they become dysregulated, other students may try to help. They may try to engage with that person. They may try to like, hey, calm down, man, it's okay something like that. Um, and maybe that's okay. And maybe it's not. And so you can let the rest of the class know what would you like them to do in these moments. So in the example I just gave, one of the things the professor said is, if this happens, I don't want other students to get involved. Like, I will handle this. So if we have 
a comment that meets this criteria, everybody else is to stay silent and we will debrief later. But I don't want arguing to occur. And that was really important because I think there were times when other people really, myself included, wanted to say something, uh, but maybe it wasn't the right time. So letting people know um, and making sure that we then follow through on um, what we've said we're going to do, like that we mean what we say and we do what we are going to say. So people both know what to expect and know that they can trust us. Um, and then, so we can utilize these strategies with everyone. And then there are some more individualized strategies that we can use with specific students. And so this may be students that come to us, they self-identify. It may be students who you identify after spending some time with them. So we wanna ask them, what do you want me to do? But maybe also, what do you want me to not do? So if I work with somebody who I know um, gets sort of physically escalated, um, where maybe they engage in like high levels of like self-stimulatory behavior, like jumping, flapping, pacing. Um, I might ask them in those moments when it's disruptive, what do you want me to do? And then what is important that I don't do? And sometimes people will say like, don't touch me. Don't put a hand on my shoulder. Don't, you know, repeat my name several times. But that's again, part of that like compassionate humility, I think is asking the person how they like to be treated and addressed and what doesn't work for them. We can also think about and really actively engaging and sharing, I kind of hate to call it a burden, but that's the language that's often used, but share this process of creating solutions. So as much as we want to ask the person, what do you need from me? We also want to come to the table prepared with like, these are the things I'm thinking. And we're open to whether that's going to work or not, but we also don't want to put everything back on the student to tell us all about what they need, what they want, what works, what doesn't work. It sh we, our goal is to have this be collaborative. Um, we want to be honest and realistic. So if somebody asks for something that you can't do, whether it's a systemic reason, a personal reason, a space reason, to say that and to be realistic. And so if you, um, if somebody says, what I really need to do is like scream at the top of my lungs every 30 minutes um, in this classroom, like that's probably not. And so, or if somebody says, I need to, um, or I can't, let's say, wear an eye protection in the lab, um, is that really something we can accommodate? If it's a sensory sensitivity, we want to be sent, like understanding of that, but I'm pretty sure in most lab settings, there's required materials that you wear, and it's not really optional. So we want to be realistic about those things. And then we want to consider what is in our control. So like we talked about with the syllabus, there's going to be things that we want to do for folks that we're not able to for whatever reason. There's also going to be for our students, like they may have internal triggers or we call them antecedents that are not in our control. And so there's only so much we can do, but also understanding from your student what else may be at play in these situations that is you wouldn't be aware of or in control of. So at UWT, um, we have lots of students um, who are experiencing homelessness that are enrolled in programs. And so this is an area where we want our professors and staff to know this, but we can't necessarily do anything about it. Um, but this does play into possibly the number or amount of disruptive behaviors you may see. So somebody who is neurodiverse that is also experiencing homelessness may be prone to have more disruptive behaviors for reasons that there's really not much you can do about. But when we know that, it gives us perspective in how we respond. And then the last piece, and uh, this is assuming good intentions. And so I will be honest, this can be hard for me, um, but essentially we want to go into instances of disruptive behaviors with assuming the person is not 
desiring to disrupt the class or to upset me personally or to derail my lesson. And so while they may not be engaging in disruptive behaviors to like make this a better learning environment, we also don't want to assume that they are sabotaging or that they are doing this sort of for some nefarious reason. And so like with disruptive behaviors like self-stimulatory behaviors, um, we that is often a need for that person. And so we wanna view it through that lens um, when we think about how we're going to handle it versus assuming that this person is chewing gum in my ear just to bother me, um, which sometimes it feels like that because they like, I did have a client who would always come in chewing, like, I don't even know, it was like hubba bubba gum. It was enormous and blowing bubbles. And they knew that it drove me a little bit crazy, um, but they kept doing it. But it was really because it was a sensory need to keep that mouth moving. Um, and so we had to kind of work together on that. But it did for a while feel like I was like, this is just happening because I said I didn't like it. And then in the moment when we are experiencing maybe a disruption that feels larger than typical or we don't know what to do, here are some things we can do in those moments. Use a visual support. So if you are working with um, especially a, a person, an autistic person or other neurodiverse students, write it down for them, um, put it up on the board. A lots and lots of verbal redirection is likely not going to be successful. It will likely escalate the situation. And so I really advocate for any type of visual support that we can utilize. Sometimes that also means like showing somebody what we're talking about. Um, and so in, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have like a super great example at the college level, but often with younger kids, we might say something like, um, if, you know, if we can go out into the hall to take a break, then you can watch a video on your phone. And then we'll actually show the phone as opposed to just talking about it. Um, but so you might finding ways to show people what we're talking about or writing it down so that they can have more time to process. Because that's the other thing um, is that the more dysregulated we are, the more impacted our processing is. And that's why we often make not our best decisions when we're agitated. We often make impulsive decisions. And then as best we can to model calmness, so we want to try, the more escalated other people are, we want to try to be even calmer, even calmer than we originally were. This is definitely one of those easier said than done. Um, but over time, you know, we practice that, we want to try to keep the class calm, keep ourselves calm, and uh, try to keep our rate of speech at least at baseline, if not slower. We don't want to raise our voices. Um, we want to just really try to model that calmness. And then acknowledge and redirect. So if somebody is very agitated, I might say, I can see you're very upset. I need you to go into the hall and I'll meet you there. Or I can see that you're not ready to move on. So I'm going to let you continue to work on this and I'm going to come back later. So ignoring um, is typically not the best response to disruptive behavior um, because that behavior is serving some kind of need for that person. So we want to acknowledge that it's happening and see if we can sort of like use that compassion. Like I see this is really hard for you or I see that you're very upset and then couple it with what is the alternative? What do I need you to do to kind of like return to some semblance of like baseline or safety? And then this is like the uh, mantra at the autism center that we live by every day, which is that at the end of the day, we want to survive with dignity. And that is for us. And that is for our students and our clients. And depending on the level of disruptive behavior it is, that may seem like really like, whoa, like what, what are you guys thinking about? Um, but really we want to preserve our dignity. We don't want to lose our cool. And then we also want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to preserve the dignity of our students. And so if we have a student that has different learning needs, 
um, and they are getting escalated, we want to think about how we treat them and interact with them um, to ensure that we are not sort of treating them like a child or infantilizing them or talking to them like a baby. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we think like, okay, processing speed is going to be different. It's going to be harder. The more dysregulated you are, I need to talk to you in like short sentences, um, clear and concise. <clears throat> um, but that also doesn't mean we're going to say things like sit, stand, quiet, um, because that's not preserving somebody's dignity. So considering that, and then also like how we deal as a whole class and sort of debrief when there are incidences or when something kind of out of the norm has happened. Um, because if it's something that you notice, right, likely your students are noticing it too. And depending on the everyone's level of comfort, sometimes just talking about it and sort of acknowledging it can help us to all understand what's going on for this person. Uh, neurodiversity as a whole, but certainly in my experience, autism is widely misunderstood. And so part of making our spaces safe for neurodiverse students and making them welcoming and supportive is being able to spread awareness and knowledge about these different types of neurodiversity and these different um, individual differences and to help kind of normalize them and to explain them so that people have a better understanding of why somebody may do what they do. Um, because if you live it every day, you probably have a lot of understanding and tolerance for individual differences. If it isn't something you've really been exposed to, it can be very like jarring and off-putting. And so part of that preserving of dignity is like in a, an appropriate way is sort of increasing awareness and education about individual differences. And look at that, right up to 1039. <laughs> so I think um, there will be a chance for questions maybe after the break, um, but I will maybe hand it over to Eric or someone. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, want to just acknowledge you before we take a break. Um, Catherine and Patty from the UW Autism Center, thanks so much for that. We are going to take a comfort break. Um, we've had a 90-minute session here, so we'll take a 10-minute comfort break. See you all back at 10.50. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> 